You're listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Pond University is your one-stop shop for all things pond management. It is hosted by Mitchell Ziski and Megan Gunn from Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Join us as we talk with biologists, managers and pond owners about the topics and tools needed to manage your pond for good habitat and great fishing. So grab a notebook and a beverage and sit back and enjoy Pond University. G'day and welcome back to Pond University, the uh, podcast for everything pond management. Uh, I'm your host, Mitchell Ziski, and I'm joined by my co-host, Megan. Hi, Megan. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Mitch? I'm good. Um, I hope everyone is surviving the winter. How are you uh, enjoying the winter so far? I'm not. I went outside yesterday and ran right back inside. It's so (laughs) cold. And it started snowing. It just... We yeah. had what eighty degrees in November, and now it's snowing. I know. <laughs> we um, I think we were spoiled a little bit in November, and you know, uh, for those wondering, we're recording this episode on December first. Um, it'll probably be released uh, maybe early in the new year, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely gotten cold. It's starting to feel and look a lot like winter. Um, another great um milestone for december 1st is that uh, even though you'll be listening to this as episode three for pond university december 1st is the date that the podcast officially launched so um, not that not that that will mean much to you as you listen (laughs) to this because it will already be launched and it's probably it'll be some point in the future but um it is exciting for us we're exactly we're really excited about it and uh hopefully we can bring a little bit more pep in our step today because of that so (laughs) Um, so what are some of the things you, you like to do in the winter? You said you went outside and then ran back inside. So do you, you spend most of your time inside during the winter time well, hiding? Okay. So I grew up in the Great Lakes area. So I, I grew up in Lower Lake Michigan and we spent time just playing in the snow all the time. And then I went to Purdue. At, I, went to, <laughs> I went to school at Purdue and walking to campus through the snow from like my dorm, that just, it ruined it for me. It was just so mm-hmm. cold. Um, and so now, I mean... Sometimes I like to go sledding. Sometimes I like to just really look at the snow from the inside where it's warm. <laughs> but it just, it's not the same as it used to be. Yeah. I tell you, some of the coldest, the, some of the times where I've been my coldest is walking across campus to a meeting or something like that. Yeah. It, you know, if it's, if it's in the single digits and that wind is blowing here, it, it can get so cold. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, you know, and I think too, you know, right now it's pretty gloomy outside. I think if it's sunny and cold, that's one thing. But if it's if it's gl- a little gloomy and cold, then it doesn't want to, want to make day. you go out there. So coming from Australia, are you used to the Indiana winters now? I think I'm I'm more used to the, used to them. It's um it's been an interesting progression. Like when I first moved here. In the summer, you know, this as I approached the, my first winter, I was terrified, and I went and <laughs> bought all of the cold weather jackets and equipment that I could find. And you know, it was probably like fifty degrees on campus, and I was the one bundled up, you know. Um, and then, you know, over the past few years, I've really enjoyed the winters. I've I, every time it snows, I get excited like a little kid, and I love shoveling the driveway. <laughs> um, but I think I've finally reached the point where I've had enough of them. Like even just, and I don't know if it's because of the COVID pandemic and all the social isolation that we've been yeah. dealing with, but this year I just am not excited for winter at all. Um, so, so another uh, reason to make us stay inside, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's too cold to even want to go and just walk around and get fresh air and yeah. Yeah. But you know, maybe if we get some good ice on the on the ponds and the lakes, I'll do some ice fishing and that'll cheer yeah. up a little bit. So, essential pond terms: the segment where we hope to expand your vocabulary by defining important terms for pond management. In this episode, you will hear the term interstitial spaces. This term means the small spaces that occur in fish habitat. This could be the small crevices between rocks 
the small gaps in logs and branches, or even the small gaps between aquatic vegetation. These spaces are important, particularly for small fish, as they provide a hiding spot. They can also be important spaces for small fish to look for food, such as insects or macroinvertebrates. Speaking of macroinvertebrates, this is another term you'll hear today. This term just means large invertebrates, or invertebrates you don't need a microscope to see. So macroinvertebrates are things like worms, mayfly larvae, and crayfish. These macroinvertebrates provide important food for small fishes, like juvenile bass, and larger fishes like adult sunfish. In the last episode, we spoke to Dave Osborne, and he, he told us a little bit about what happens to ponds in the wintertime and how we can prepare our ponds for winter. And, you know, we learned that there are some negative impacts that winter can have on ponds, and, and we want to try and avoid some of those impacts by, by taking some proactive management uh, throughout the year, but then also doing things like aeration uh, in the wintertime. Um, but... One thing that winter does bring is it actually brings an opportunity to do some management to your pond that you don't get at other times of the year. And one of those opportunities is uh, putting fish habitat and fish structures out in your pond. And, and what you can do if, if you've got safe ice on your pond, you can actually drag these structures out on the ice and put them exactly where you want to. And then, you know, as the ice melts in the spring, those structures will fall right into the pond where you want them. Uh, and this can be, you know, much easier than trying to drag it out with a boat and, and getting them in place during the summertime. And so, um, so given that thought, we, you know, we wanted to uh, have a guest on the show today who knows all about fish structure, um, fish habitat, adding fish habitat to your pond, the importance of fish habitat. Um, and so she's going to tell us all about different types of fish habitat today and, and the things that we can do um, to, to our ponds to, to improve fish production. I guess one of the other opportunities you have during the wintertime too is you're not spending as much time outside and so you've got more time to work on some of these projects and build some fish habitat and, and uh, so that you can put them in your pond. So, And we should probably mention that one of the best things you can do during the winter is sit inside and listen to this podcast. And and the whole Natural Resources University suite of podcasts. That's right. The uh, the NIU network. You know, if you're uh, I'm sure there are some of you out there that are just diehard pond and fish people and yes. you know, I completely understand <laughs> that. Um, but a lot of you probably enjoy hunting and enjoy managing your woodlands and your and your other, and your land for other things and so um, you know, definitely check out the podcasts in that NRU network. Uh, I think there's Habitat University, Fire University, and Deer University. So uh, we'll link to those in the show notes as well. So who are we going to be talking to today, Mitch? So today we are joined by Sandy Clark Colax from the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Hi, Sandy. How are you? Good. Hi. Thanks, Mitch and Megan. It's nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming. We're uh, excited to have you on today and to tell us a little bit about fish habitat in ponds and lakes. So, so um, so you have a lot of experience working with fish and lakes and reservoirs. Um, so how long have you been at the Department of Natural Resources? Uh, almost thirteen years. So uh, people may may notice from my accent, I'm not from Indiana. I'm actually from Missouri. Um, so not a Hoosier, but I've been here about 13 years. So um, originally started working out on rivers. Uh, that was my par primary background. And then when I came to Indiana, started really working on reservoirs and reservoir fish management. Great. And so I'm sure you've, you've probably um, got lots of stories about reservoirs and, and maybe even ponds that have been managed well and managed poorly and um, probably seen lots of interesting fish and probably probably seen some trophy fish that many anglers would like to catch so do you have any uh any interesting stories you want to tell us from your job um I'm trying to think i mean i think reservoir habitat is is definitely one of the newer um kind of forefront of where research is going in fish management so i have the really unique opportunity being part of the uh, national Reservoir Fish Habitat Partnership, which is a national uh, partnership that is funded a lot from Fish and Wildlife Service dollars through the National uh, Fish Habitat Program. Uh, so I get to go to, well, pre-COVID, we would have an annual meeting 
And it was really interesting because there would be representatives from all over the US um, working on reservoirs. And that's not something you really think of, especially out west, um, you know, that they have these large reservoirs. And so kind of hearing some of the really different uh, issues that people have in reservoir management across the country. So, you know, out west, it's a lot of drought management and water level issues of, of reservoirs dropping, you know, 60, 70 feet. Uh, for years because of drought conditions and how how you put habitat back in something like that with you know we think 10 or 15 feet is a lot of water fluctuation here in Indiana but you know we're talking 50 feet or more out there um, but then also hearing in Florida where instead of digging down they actually just berm up and create reservoirs and there are these perfect rectangles um, so it's just really interesting to hear the different you know, systems across the US and, and the different issues that are happening. So it's, it's really neat to kind of get that big picture um, spectrum. And there's just a lot of really cool research and projects. Uh, a lot of these programs are, you know, volunteer based in many states. Um, Texas has a really unique program where you know bass groups got together and started working with high schoolers to start raising aquatic vegetation that, to reestablish in reservoirs and the whole program is just done with high schoolers um, and they've built aquaculture systems and greenhouses at these high schools um, and so they're running that program primarily through volunteers and high school students so there's some really unique things going on um, there's also ideas out west, they look at, you know, crafting projects where they're taking um, native vegetation seeds and putting them in these kind of bio balls, and they just drive around the lake throwing them, hopefully <laughs> hoping that they're going to go to shore and establish vegetation. So there's all sorts of kind of unique things, um, you know, people just trying all sorts of kind of crazy ideas to, to see what works. Um, so I really enjoy going to that that meeting and conference and kind of just seeing what's going on across the country in reservoir management. Yeah, that sounds really interesting, and I'm sure there are, you know, there are things that you're looking to maybe bring back to to Indiana and see something that might work here. And and like you said, it's just interesting to see the different approaches to to reservoir management in different parts of the U.S. So yeah, definitely, um, you know. We kind of started getting into reservoir management in about 2015, um, and everything we are doing here is being done somewhere else. You know, basically, we were able to go out and look at what other states are doing and kind of bring back what worked for us um, as far as scale wise and implementation. So, yeah, definitely. Um, and some states like Pennsylvania have had programs for 20, 30 years. Um, wow. So there's these states have been doing it a really long time, and I guess one of the advantages to coming to the party late is that you kind of already see what everybody else is doing, um, and they've kind of weeded out like this doesn't really work well. So that's kind of an advantage of getting into it late. Pond Species Profile, the segment where we will showcase the biology and ecology of popular and not so popular pond species. In this episode, we will profile the channel catfish. Channel catfish are the most commonly caught catfish throughout the U.S. and are commonly stocked in fish ponds. They are a gray-brown catfish that can grow to over 20 pounds, but are more commonly caught at 2 to 4 pounds in most ponds. Channel catfish use their barbells to detect prey in their environment, and they will eat a variety of foods such as plants, invertebrates, crayfish, small fish, and dead and decaying organic matter. They can also be trained to eat pelleted fish feed if you are hoping to increase their growth rates. Catfish spawn in the summer by nesting in hollow logs and similar structure. When the fry hatch, they cluster together in very tight balls, making them less susceptible to predation by largemouth bass if there is not sufficient habitat for protection. Channel catfish can be stocked as the only species in a pond where they are caught for fun and food. And this is a great option for small ponds less than a half acre in size. Channel catfish can also be stocked as part of a larger fish community. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, fish habitat. What is fish habitat today and, and some of the different um, fish structures you can put in 
in ponds and reservoirs. Um, you know, you've talked a little bit about reservoirs so far, and and that's your role with the with the DNR. Um, for those that are listening, they might be more interested in in their own ponds and, and smaller bodies of water. Are there many differences in terms of the habitat that you know between a reservoir or a smaller pond, or is is much of of the work that you've done also applicable to some of these smaller water bodies? Um, I think with reservo reservoirs, you know, typically across the board, there is a serious lack of habitat, it, whether it's aquatic vegetation, standing timber, logs, rocks, things like that. Um, that can happen in small ponds. I think a lot of times in small ponds, we almost have the opposite of where we have too much habitat. Maybe you have overgrown aquatic vegetation or things like that. Um, but we do have instances where, you know, maybe you've built a new pond, it's really deep, um, you know, vegetation hasn't established yet, or, you know, maybe you want to, uh, you have a dock or something, you kind of want to congregate fish around that dock. Structure or habitat is a great way to accomplish that. Um, it's also a great thing, you know, part of, of habitat and structure is to, you know, provide space for a fish to hide. So if you do have issues with great blue herons or, you know, river otters or things like that, putting in habitat can, can help with those sorts of issues also because it does provide a space for fish to hide that they can get away from these predators. Yeah, that's a really good point and something I hadn't, hadn't thought about. Um, you know, we all, we all like a place to hide sometimes. <laughs> can you tell us um, just generally a little bit about fish habitat? What is fish habitat? What does it look like? Why is it important to fish? You mentioned that, you know, um, fish need some of this shelter to hide from, but are there other reasons that they use fish habitat? Uh, so fish habitat can kind of hit mate different lifestyles. So um, there's different types of habitat, usually, you know, rock or pebble that you could put in for a spawning substrate. Um, for certain species. So you can add habitat to help with spawning. Um, you can have add habitat that has um, smaller spaces, you know, for juvenile fish to hide in um, if you don't have a lot of vegetation in your pond. Um, and then, you know, as habitat gets bigger and the spaces are spread out, obviously bigger fish can enter those spaces and different life stages would be using that. So you know, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done on, on habitat. You know, the big question is how much habitat do you need to change that biomass in a lake or a reservoir or a pond? Um, nobody really knows. There's no equation that says put in five of these structures that equals 200 more bass. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that that's not there yet. Um, but what we do know is when putting in this structure, you want complexity, just like you would find in, you know, if mother nature was doing it, you may have cedar trees that fall in or oak trees. Um, you know, all those different leaves and branch types provide different space and habitat. Um, so having different looking structures is really important when you put it out there. So having a mix. So we generally, when we do projects and we, you know, recommend projects to other people we don't just put all one type of structure in there we try to mix it up to create complexity out there and so um you know you've mentioned aquatic vegetation a few times and i think people sometimes particularly people in ponds with a lot of vegetation they sometimes forget how important that is as fish habitat and um you know it's it's free you don't you don't have to buy yeah. it and put it in there for the most part um and so um, you know, if if people do have aquatic vegetation in their ponds, absolutely, it can it can get out of control, and you need to manage it. But you don't want to eradicate it completely. And yeah, uh, natural aquatic vegetation is the gold star. Mm -hmm. Like you can't beat what Mother Nature has put out there. Um, there's actually companies that are working on trying to create synthetic and artificial plants to put in reservoirs to try to mimic that behavior. So reservoirs where you have, you know, water fluctuations where vegetation cannot grow, um, aquatic vegetation, there's actually companies designing artificial materials to simulate aquatic vegetation. So, you know, yes, definitely um, you cannot get anything better than natural aquatic vegetation in 
appropriate levels and appropriate amounts. Um, obviously, too much of a good thing is not great. Um, so yeah, I definitely, I mean, don't get rid of what everyone else is wanting for sure. I mean, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so, I mean, gold star aquatic vegetation, um, then, you know, based on the literature and what we know, kind of the next best thing is natural, you know, felling trees is a great option. Um, if you have, you know, trees around your lake or close by that you can cut them and drag them um, into the lake, that's really been shown to be, you know, prep preferred by juvenile fish, uh, bass, and things like that, because it does provide year-round cover. Um, usually they're in shallower water where your juvenile fish would be using for nursery habitat and things like that. So, you know, what we've seen natural really does a lot better than artificial can, but in some instances, you know, you may not have shoreline trees and you can't get them to your lake. And so artificial structures kind of fill that void of something more manageable, something that you could put out, you know, with you know, no heavy equipment or things like that. Yeah, and I imagine, you know, with aquatic vegetation varies from year to year, um, and even with, um, you know, nat you know, trees and wood that you put in there, that's going to decompose over time. And so I guess one of the benefits of some of the artificial vegetation is that it its durability and longevity is it's longer and, and that it's more stable than, you know, it doesn't fluctuate like the aquatic vegetation does. Absolutely. So... Uh, from the work that other states have done, we use um, some structures that are made out of pallets, so untreated pallets that you can get for free. Um, we make these big cubes out of them, fill them with concrete blocks so they sink. Um, underwater, those have been found to last about 30 years. Oh, wow. Um, some of the other structures that we use are made out of PVC. Obviously, those are going to last for hundreds of years. So. Mm -hmm. It kind of gets, you know, for us doing the scale that we're doing, we're really looking at, you know, very long things, things with very long lifespans because we can't be out there replacing it all the time. But in those projects, we're also um, felling shoreline trees whenever possible because we know that's a very inexpensive, you know, immediate results um, type of project that we can do. Great. And so... Once again, it's creating that complexity, not just doing a bunch of the same thing. Excellent. It's just interesting that the the forestry and the fishery side are combining like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and it's really interesting. Like some of the stuff out west, they have um, invasive white cedar trees. And so part of these projects is they're cutting these invasive trees and using them for habitat in their reservoir. So nice. it really can be paired with, you know, Maybe you have an overgrown field with cedar trees that you're wanting to cut for maybe upland bird habitat. A great use for those trees would be throwing them in your pond. Um, you know, one of the biggest programs, you know, that most people know about is using your Christmas tree to put, you know, a lot of people use their Christmas tree, throw it in the lake. Um, those have very, very short lifespans. Um, three years is usually how long, like a you know, spruce or, or traditional Christmas tree, you know, because those needles are falling off while you're putting it in there. And then you're just left with <laughs> yeah. basically a small stick. <laughs> um, so, you know, Christmas trees are really, really easy option. You could get lots of them for free um, a lot of times, but, you know, you're going to have to be constantly replacing those. Um, and a lot of people, and this is something we haven't touched on that we get a lot of questions about and some people get frustrated about, oh, it's just going to catch all my lures. You know, I'm going to lose all my lures out here. Um, and so there are artificial um, plastic structures that are kind of designed to be lure free. Um, so there's a couple of private companies. There's one in Illinois that actually makes, they are simulating plants, but he uses vinyl siding recycled vinyl siding and he cuts them kind of in leaf like shapes and you put them in a concrete bucket and so it simulates a plant well the lure is just going to slide right off of those it's not going to get hooked on there very easily so um 
I definitely think throwing in Christmas trees, yeah, you're probably going to end up with a lot of lures hanging on that. But in any good lake that you go to where you're catching fish, there's going to be habitat and you're going to lose lures. Yeah. So, you know, that's just the trade-off. Um, and I think it goes back to to having a bit of a plan and being a little strategic about what you do in your pond. You know, you can... Uh, you can add fish habitat in areas that you may not regularly fish, like a, you know the center of the pond, the deeper parts of the pond that can help with with fish um, populations. And there may be areas that you know the beach or cleared areas for fishing, the docks. Maybe you have other types of habitat that are less prone to snagging lures on. Yeah, and absolutely, if this is your private pond, you could absolutely put buoys on these types of structures so you know exactly where they are. So, you yeah, know, that's a good idea. You're, you're not casting into it, you're casting on the edge of it. So, yeah, when this is your own water body, you know, you can write the rules here. Um, and you do have control of where you're putting them. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we really look at when we're placing structures is we want to make sure we're putting them in usable space for the fish. So one thing you want to make sure is, you know, if your pond is deep enough to stratify, and so that's in the summer, you're going to have this layer of the deepest part of your lake where there's not going to be oxygen and fish are not going to be found there. So there's no point in putting all your habitat in this area where fish are not going to be for large periods of the year. So we really try to focus on, you know, making sure where we put that habitat, it's going to be above that thermocline. Um, so that it's usable for fish year round. So that's just something, you know, knowing a little bit about your pond and how deep it is, um, is really important also. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, um, and two, you know, if you're looking to add um, habitat specifically for fish spawning, you know, that needs to be typically in fairly shallow areas. Otherwise the, the fish won't utilize those, those spaces for spawning. Right, right. So you kind of want to know what your objective is um, you know, if you just want to, you know, if you're looking to increase spawning or create spawning, yeah, you may want to look at where you're seeing fish beds or things like that. Um, you know, but also if you're wanting to help juvenile fish, you know, they're in that, you know, two foot to maybe three, four foot water depth range. And then obviously bigger fish are probably going to be out deeper. And so really you want to look at that kind of holistically. Um, and one thing we're looking at is, you know, creating kind of a, a fish highway that fish, you know, when a juvenile's up in the shore, it has a safe passageway to get to deeper water as it grows and creating kind of, you know, a, a path for it filled with habitat so he can get out there or she can get out there safely. Um, and so, and that's really where, you know, felled trees are really nice because they are so long you know, it kind of covers probably two or three depth zones moving out into your lake. And thinking about spawning is do, I guess, do pond owners need to be concerned about going and clearing off sedimentation or silt that has settled on whatever structure that they've set out for, for a spawning bed? Or is this kind of occurring naturally? Definitely something maybe, I don't think you would need to do it every year. That's probably something you would want to keep an eye on in your pond or lake just to look at that and I don't know if clearing off but maybe just going and adding a new little light layer um, every so many years would be beneficial. Um, I would think if you have that much sediment coming into your pond you're probably needing to look at other practices to decrease that um, but normally bluegill and bass and things like that I mean their life history is to kind of clean sediment out of beds anyway so you know I think it normal light layers is something they can manage pretty easily. So Sandy, um, can you talk a little bit about the difference in fish habitat between say attracting fish to a certain area um, as opposed to increasing fish numbers and fish production in a lake? Absolutely and that's something we really struggle with of you know the definition of a fish attractor versus habitat and you know I don't say it's it has really anything to do with the type of habitat. We like to think it's more about scale. So if you have, if you think about your pond or a reservoir as a, a bathtub, you know, and there's nothing in there, just blank sides, you know, if you drop one thing in there, all the fish are gonna go right there. You're concentrating them. And that's really a fish attractor. 
You know, you're not going to make more fish. You're not going to protect more fish. You're just concentrating them. Now, the question is, you know, if you add five, does that start changing the biology of the reservoir or the pond, you know, or do you need 10 or 20 or things like that? Um, and like I said, that's where we don't have those, that equation yet or those numbers yet. Um, so, you know, really we go with, and we're working on, you know, large reservoirs like Lake Monroe and Patoka. So we just try to do as much as possible. No, um, but there are some recommendations um, on our private pond and lake management website. Um, we've used a lot of, like I said, Pennsylvania has had a very long standing program. Um, and they do have recommendations for like, you know, 20 structures per acre. So there are some general guidelines that people can kind of use to um, to go by of, of how much you need. You know, for, you know, a small pond, you know, probably three or four structures. You know, you obviously don't want to, if you're fishing this pond, you don't want so much out there that you're always getting hooked on or always getting snagged on things and things like that. So, you know, there are some recommendations, but definitely knowing kind of the depth of your pond and, you know, the size would really come into that calculation. Okay. And we'll make sure we link to that website in our show notes so that people can find it. Um, you know, one thing, talking about having too much structure in a pond or, you know, maybe not so much a reservoir, but uh, I know if aquatic vegetation gets really dense, it can actually become difficult for predators like bass to 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 find and capture their prey and then you can cause imbalances in the fish population and I imagine that can be the same if you're adding fish habitat too if you if you fall you know 50 or 100 trees into your pond there's going to be a lot of nooks and crannies for those um, prey to hide in and may make it difficult for bass and other predators to eat them absolutely absolutely so you know for vegetation the general guidelines is you know 20 to 40 percent of your your pond or or water body you want vegetation. Um, we don't know if that's a one-to-one -one for artificial structures or not, but I definitely would say, you know, you don't want to go over probably 50% of your pond surface volume acres um, with habitat. And so we do some calculations when we're planning projects, you know, most of our structures are kind of four by four, four foot by four foot um, and so if we do 20 of those per acre, we can come up kind of a surface area of what we're covering. Um, and then you can kind of figure out how many structures do you need to impact a certain area. So there are some general calculations people could use to kind of figure out roughly how many structures they would want to put in. Can you tell us a little bit about the different types of structures that you build and you put out and maybe where you would use some over others and if certain structures appeal to particular species. Um, you know, I know uh, I've looked on your website and there's, you know, lots of different structures you guys put out there. And so if, you know, from a, from a pond owner's standpoint, you know, if they maybe only have a, you know, limited resources and time, you know, which ones might they best choose for their pond? Yeah, if you just kind of Google fish habitat, there is all sorts of crazy designs. It's really kind of the Wild West. Um, I mean, there's stuff, people designing stuff with corrugated piping and, and laundry baskets to make these like simulated trees. Um, and I think one of the questions that we kind of keep coming back to is, is you know, the depth, you know, fish attractor versus habitat versus trash. And you know, yeah. you know, back in the day, people put cars in rivers to stabilize shoreline. You know, tires were really, really popular. You can still see tires in some of our mm -hmm. reservoirs and things like that. So, you know, yeah, that made really good habitat, but it also released contaminants into these water bodies. So, you know, making sure that the materials you use are safe for water um, is really Number one, so making sure if you're using pallets or um, posts or, or logs or fence posts that you're buying, making sure that they are all untreated. You don't want to use any treated materials. So no railroad ties, no you know telephone poles, things like that that have treatment in it um, because that can kill your fish. Um, and so definitely looking at your materials. Um, you know we use a PVC which is rated for drinking water. So we use um, <clears throat> a lot of that in our materials. 
Um, some other states are actually using um, its, its orange pipe that you see sticking out of the ground when they run utility lines underground. Um, and they'll actually get the cuttings that are too short to be used and put those in concrete in buckets and put those in the pond to simulate, you know, plants or things like that growing. Um, so there's kind of all sorts of different materials that can be used. Um, you know, we try to limit the types of materials we use to natural, so lumber, logs, trees, things like that, or PVC that is rated for drinking water. Um, just because we want to make sure what we're putting out there is safe. Um, if you're working in natural lakes in northern Indiana, you, and one thing I should mention is, you know, natural lakes, things like that, that all requires permitting um, through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, and DNR Division of Water. Um, if you're working on your private pond, you don't need a permit. Um, but if you're working in natural lakes, you have to use natural materials. So untreated lumber or trees. Um, in reservoirs, we can use plastics because those are artificial systems. Um, the other big thing when, so considering what materials you wanna use is a big one. And really a lot of that goes to um, ease of installing the materials. So um, you think you built, these pallet structures, you know, you're using pallets, um, they float. So we build these cube structures and then we fill them with about eight concrete blocks. So they weigh several hundred pounds um, when they are filled up. So, you know, the average homeowner is not going to be able to put that into their lake when it's full of water or their pond. Um, so ideally the great time to install structure is, you know, before your pond or lake fills up because you can drive equipment in there um, and do that. We have a specialized boat that allows us to actually build the structures, fill them full of weight and push them off the front um, to put them out there. So if you're doing this pre, you know, as your pond is being constructed, you can haul all sorts of things into that lake bed, giant rocks, trees, root stumps, things like that. Um, the thing you will want to do is like on roots and tree stumps is as the lake fills, if you do not have those anchored down, they will float until they get waterlogged. And if you want to keep stuff in specific areas, you're going to have to anchor it, um, which you can do with, you know, earth anchors or things like that, putting cables or ropes over them. Um, so yeah, if you're building your pond, you really can use a lot of natural materials because you can drive equipment in there and put it. Um, and you know, if you're clearing land to put this pond in, you, you may have all these materials from when you built your pond and you can just put them right back in there, um, which is a great option. And you can use some of these bigger, heavier structures um, because you can drive equipment in there. Now, if your pond is already full, um, and you want to add structure, that's where the plastics come in because they are so light. So we use what is called a Hoosier cube, which is modified from George's design. And this is a four by four PVC cube with corrugated tubing just spidered up in the middle. Um, and those sink using weight of water. So they have holes drilled on them and they have open ends. So you know, a person can carry that to the end of their dock or out in a rowboat and you just push it down and it sinks. And once it's filled with water, you're not, you're not moving it. I mean, they're very, they're very dense. Um, so that's a great option for a homeowner that's got an existing pond and want to add some structure. Um, you know, Christmas trees, a lot of people do that. Once again, you probably need to put some weights on it to sink it and keep it down there. Um, and you can just drill holes, run some you know, nylon rope through it and anchor them with cinder blocks. Um, you know, if we actually have ice this time, this winter, that's another great time because you can put these out on the ice um, and as the ice melts, they will sink down. Um, one of the other things is a lot of times they will kind of move around as they're sinking because, you know, part of them will be submerged possibly and part of them out. So they can't blow around um, if you have some wave action. But yeah, putting them out on the ice 
Um, a lot of people in Wisconsin and stuff do that. If you go up there, they'll just have lines of trees laying out on the ice. And that's kind of what, I think they mark the, the ice highways with them. Um, and then they just sink when the ice goes down. So that's another, winter is actually a great time to put habitat out. As long as the ice is thick enough. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You want to make sure, check your ice conditions. Definitely. And don't, definitely don't drive equipment out on the ice unless you are very sure of the conditions, which I don't think we've had those conditions in a long time. So. Yeah, your, your brand new uh, <laughs> truck is probably not good fish habitat. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. It would make awesome fish habitat, but probably not make you very happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely on the DNR website, we have um, kind of descriptions and some basic building construction information about the different types of habitat structures that we use. So. We use the, the PVC structure called the Hoosier Cube. Um, we also use pallet structures, which is um, one, two, three, four, five pallets put together to make a big cube filled with concrete blocks. Um, we also use two designs that Pennsylvania designed, which are called uh, porcupine cribs. And these are kind of, it's a cube or a pyramid with two by two boards screwed together to make a big pyramid. There's a big one and a little one. Um, and th we use those designs also. Um, and then there's actually a design that Pennsylvania came up with that's called a bass spawning platform. And it looks kind of like a really short picnic table. Um, and that's kind of for the bass to use for spawning also. So, um, and then, like I said, there's tons of other designs out there um, for just None of them proven, just um, people being like, okay, this looks like something in nature, surely it will work. Um, and there are some private companies that do um, make kits that you can order and build them yourself. Um, there's fish hiding out of Illinois, and this is the vinyl siding that simulates kind of plants. Um, there's mossbacks, which I believe are out of Texas, and they make different types of uh, plastic structures and those really are geared for private pond owners that need something light that they can throw in from either a john boat or from the shore um, and and those have quite a bit you know of documentation on their effectiveness um yeah that's some great information and and if you go to the the dnr website you'll see all you know photos and descriptions of all of those different types of habitats that sandy just mentioned and um and start to to dream big for your pond. Um, I you know I just want to reiterate too that if you have a a fairly typical pond that has a good amount of aquatic vegetation, then it's likely you don't need to add any of these artificial fish habitats. Um, but in that scenario, you might want to add a couple of places in your pond that might help attract fish to for fishing. Um, or if you you have a pond that's deeper or or more um, turbid that maybe lacks some of this. Um, aquatic vegetation then these these habitats could could help increase some of the fish production in your pond so yeah absolutely um and one other website that people might be interested in and this is a website off of the national reservoir fish habitat partnership and it's called friends of reservoirs um and so you can just google that and it comes up and they have um they actually this shows projects across the country. They have grant programs for municipalities, towns, 501c3s that give money to um, public waters for habitat, dredging, vegetation, invasive control. Um, and so they have a lot of really great information on there. They have a projects page where you can kind of see the projects that are going on in other states. Um, and one of the other cool things is they actually funded um, the university to write a book about reservoir and habitat management. And so a copy of that book is actually on there under the science tab. And that like for those people who want a really good bed night story, bedtime night story, this would be, you know, if you're really interested in this sort of stuff, it goes through kind of all the biology and the water chemistry and just all sorts of different types of structures that can be done um, on massive scales, including like artificial reefs and things like that. So um, there's some, that's kind of 
the consolidation of a lot of the research that's gone on about about habitat um, on a big scale. Great. Yeah, that does sound like some good uh, bedtime reading. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly in the winter time when you you know you may not want to brave the elements to go fishing, you can plan your projects for the for your uh, pond or lake. Absolutely. I mean, it's a yeah, great time to start building your structures and putting them out there before the fish start spawning next year would be, you know, having that out there before, you know, April would be really good. Do you, do you have any recommendations for our listeners, any books, podcasts, or videos related to um, fish habitat that you think that they should listen to or check out? Uh, like I said, Friends of Reservoir website is really good. Um, they also have a Facebook page that's really good, um, you know, posting different projects um, across the country and stuff like that. But really, this is the forefront of fish management for the future, really, is, is this type of, of, you know, artificial structures and, and managing older reservoirs. Um, so really, I mean, this kind of conversation that isn't happening that often. So it's very cool um, to be able to talk about it on this scale and stuff. And, you know, I think people have been doing this sort of thing on their own for, you know, 20, 30 years, you know, everybody threw some Christmas trees out in their pond and stuff like that. It's just, it's kind of taking it to that next step of like creating things that are going to last more than three or five years and, and actually looking at, you know, that question of quantity of how much do I need to put out there to have an impact on the fishery. Um, and so one of the things that's really coming out with these different types of structures um, you know, other than just put it, making a place for fish to hide, it's also providing surface area for um, algae, macroinvertebrates, and things like that to grow and live on. And that is really what's lacking in, in structure or in water bodies with no structure. So there's no place for macroinvertebrates to live. There's no place for algae to grow on. There's no place for, you know, insects to lay eggs and stuff like that there's just no structure and so i'm um, really looking at um, these designs and you know there's some really cool engineering going on with surface area so you know and that's why vegetation and trees are so good because they have so much surface area and so we're that's what we're trying to mimic in that um, and using materials where you know, things aren't just going to slide off. So if you think of PVC, it's very slick. You know, it's, pro it's probably pretty hard for, you know, macroinvertebrates and things like that to stick to it. Um, but we drill holes in it. So it's like even those organisms can go inside the cube, inside the PVC and live. Um, and so that's where these private industries are really looking at, you know, different materials to coat their plastic with. So it's a a rougher surface so that things can grow on it and, and make the best little environment for it possible. So it really starts delving into like the microbiology of these aquatic systems, which is really cool. Yeah, we want we want them to be as balanced as possible. Exactly. And it's, it's not all about the fish, but well, and that's yeah, <laughs> if you have more macroinvertebrates and you have more productivity, that's going to result in better and more fish. Um, so mm -hmm. it's really looking at that very, very bottom of the food chain and working your way up where I think a lot of people just think of, oh, I'm going to put structure in to give a fit place for fish to hide. And I think that was, that was where we were, you know, 30, 40 years ago, but now we've learned, you know, it's really building the food chain is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Um, and and something, yeah, that you're right. A lot of people don't think of in, initially, but I am, you know, they, it was, I think I've seen a couple of scientific presentations over the years at conferences that have been looking at, you know, how invertebrates colonize fish structure and differences between, say, a log and a plastic structure. And, um, and you know, just looking into some of those questions and asking those questions it will hopefully really help our reservoir and pond management into the future. Absolutely. So I guess one question I had for you, Sandy, um, you know, a lot of people may be listening to this and, you know, the, the most common pond species we have here in Indiana are, are largemouth bass, uh, sunfish, and sometimes channel catfish. And are there any particular uh, structures that are 
uh, more beneficial for those species um, or is it or are a lot of fish are you know a lot of different types of fish structures beneficial for all of them um, you know it's definitely going to benefit all of them um, I think more of it's that life cycle and depth thing um, but there has been some research to show that you know even between cedar trees and hardwood trees um, not so much species difference but lifestyle difference so or life stage difference so juvenile fish tend to like cedar trees and it makes sense there's lots of very very small interstitial space for them to hide lots of places for you know small bugs to live and grow on which is what those little fish are eating and then as the fish get bigger you know they like a little more space because they can see to hunt things so hardwoods with their more spread out branches um, tend to be more characteristic of where those fish are found. Um, there's also been some really cool research just in, you know, if you're putting out Christmas trees, the design that you put them out in, you know, a circle with an open middle versus a U versus a straight line. Um, so there's a lot of research into that also that's pretty cool um, doing that. But they always found fish around them. So it's not like putting something out there, you know, fish aren't gonna use it. It's just, once again, trying to fine tune what your objective is and most bang for your buck. Um, catfish are really interesting. For most small ponds, we don't really want them reproducing because they can overpopulate very easily. Um, but, you know, that was the tire. People put tires in their ponds, you know, catfish would spawn in them, use them, because catfish are cavity nesters, so they need some sort of, you know, um, I don't want to say cave, but kind of an enclosed area where they can lay the eggs and guard them. Um, and so if you don't have anything in your lake like that, they're not going to reproduce. And if they do, all the fry or eggs are going to be eaten by bluegill. So um, they're looking for a hollow log or a rock cropping where they could get into. Um, and there has been, and one thing we have been working on is actually building what's called a catfish nesting box. And it's basically a wooden box with a big hole drilled in the end of it. And this allows the catfish to go in there and nest and have that enclosed environment where they can defend their nest. Um, and the work we've done, we've seen them using the boxes, we've seen fry in the boxes. So, um, you know, you definitely need a bigger pond or lake to do that in. If you just have, you know, a half acre pond, I wouldn't recommend it because they can overpopulate very easily. Um, but yeah, if you did want to have catfish and you didn't have that sort of habitat, you know, a nesting box is something you could make pretty easily. Um, and they definitely seem to use them. You know, one of the take homes, um, you know, from this is that, you know, you can think a lot about the life stages of the fish and different uh, habitat that can help out different life stages of those fish and that probably ties back to your message about having a diversity of habitat you know if, if you put out all the same habitat then you may be helping one particular life stage but that may not help complete the link and you know lead to more fish production so mm -hmm. absolutely and i think that's you know that's the thing we have to think about you know with fish management, you know, success isn't stocking a fish. Success is seeing that fish caught by you, you know, at a legal size or an eatable size. That's success. So I think it's, yeah, just not being like, oh, we'll throw it out there and everything, you know, be fine. You know, once again, yeah, you may get more spawning, um, but if the, all those fish get eaten before they can make it to some sort of refuge, then you are still with the same number of fish. Unfortunately, Sandy's audio cut out at the end of the interview, uh, so we don't get to hear her sign off, uh, but we do thank her for her time and thank her for the information she provided on this episode, and uh, hopefully we'll get Sandy back on the podcast again soon to talk about other pond management topics. So I, I think my biggest takeaway is the DIY pond habitat is really a, a nailed it or failed it trial and error. Um, you can put out something that will work really, really well, or you can put out something that, I mean, it's not going to do too much. Like the, the PVC piping for, for macroinvertebrates versus using a log that has some 
some grooves in it for for better habitat thinking about ecosystem the ecosystem as a whole um yeah and i i I think that's crazy that people well if people are focused on fish no they're not thinking about the macroinvertebrates um but i think that everybody should should really think of that ecosystem as a whole and how all of those parts play play a role together um what was your biggest takeaway mitch yeah i mean i think that was a great point you know you can and it ties back to us talking about the pond as an ecosystem rather than just a hole with some fish in it. Um, you know, and I think that really um, highlights the difference between fish habitat as attracting fish or fish habitat as increasing production. And I think using that habitat mm-hmm. that, um, you know, helps algae and macroinvertebrates, therefore provides food to small fish, you know, I think that's the difference between increasing production in your pond and, um, and just attracting fish to a certain area. Yeah, and thinking about I I like I like Sandy's point on what is your objective here? Why are you putting out the habitat? Um and that'll kind of really guide what type of habitat you put in to your pond or your or your bigger lake. Absolutely. And you know, I think she made the good point too that in a lot of reservoirs that she works on, they're old, they're silted up, they don't have a lot of natural habitat there. And this is different to a lot of ponds, you know, a lot of ponds have aquatic vegetation. And so um, maybe, you know, a lot of pond owners feel like they should be adding fish habitat where really they, they maybe they can just manage their vegetation differently so that they can keep some of that vegetation there for fish habitat. Mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about that either. Like you have it there, it, it serves the purpose, just kind of manage that particular piece a little bit better. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Don't just rip it all out or, or um, apply herbicides to, to kill it all. Yep. And I think, too, that the size of your pond and the depth of your pond are also important considerations. You know, like Sandy said, you don't want to put fish habitat at a depth where the fish are not going to use it. And also, yeah. if you have a, um, a small pond, you know, you may not need to add very much. Just a few pieces here and there might help out. Um, but if you add, if you have a larger pond, then providing some of that diversity and, and thinking about the arrangement of some of the habitat might be more um, important. Yeah, and making sure those juveniles can get from that shallow area to the deeper part of the of the pond. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. They if they're out in the open, they're probably going to be eaten. But if you have that kind of highway that they can follow, they have a better chance of survival. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for joining us again for this episode of Pond University. Uh, if you liked uh, the content, please uh, subscribe to the podcast spread the word, um, review us, leave us a rating, um, and also consider subscribing to the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University Network. Uh, if you have any uh, comments or questions, uh, please contact us. Uh, our, the link to our um, web pages are in the show notes. Or if you have suggestions for other topics you'd like to uh, see us cover on this podcast, please let us know. Cheerio! Pond University is hosted by Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Pond University is part of the podcast network Natural Resources University, which is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Pond University, then check out the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University podcast network. Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant are equal opportunity, equal access, and affirmative action institutions. Natural Resources University is funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. New episodes are released every Tuesday. For more information, follow us on our social media platforms at nr underscore university.